Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. It is good for us to be together even if on the fourth Sunday of Advent, that means that I'm on your phone screen or your TV screen. I pray that this morning will be a time of worship for you um, and those who you love. This uh, week, amidst uh, many sad things in my life, I've been given great joy by reading some good young adult fantasy. Uh, the series is called The Wing Feather Saga, and it's written by a singer-songwriter in Nashville named Andrew Peterson, and it follows three siblings as they discover that they are not who they thought they were. And this new identity that they're given causes everything in their life to be transformed. I've thought about this this week um, as I've looked forward to today, to this fourth Sunday in Advent, uh, where we anticipate the incarnation of the Word, where we anticipate Jesus Christ being born of the Virgin Mary. Because Mary's story uh, is about having a new identity given to you, uh, to her, and that changing every aspect of our lives. But that pattern is not just Mary's pattern. It's the Christian's pattern. For when we um, get involved with the God of Israel, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, we are getting involved with a God who saves, who makes all things right, who is promised to make all things new. He is righteous and he is good all the way down. But this God is not easy to follow. Life with this God. Is good, but sometimes it is very hard. And that's what's so lovely about Advent, is it gives us a space to confess to one another that our lives are still Advent lives, lives of light and darkness, lives of sorrow and joy, lives of hope and frustration. So what I want to invite you this morning to do is hear a familiar story, the story of the Annunciation, of the, of the story of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. And I want you to see a pattern in that story that isn't just about Mary's life with God, but it's about your life with God too. So listen carefully and listen well to the story of the Annunciation from the book that burns and is not consumed from the first chapter of Luke, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from heaven by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel said to her, Greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. But Mary was perplexed and pondered in her heart what kind of greeting this would be. And the angel said to her, Mary, do not. Fear, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive and bear in your womb a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. 
And Mary said to the angel, uh, how can this be, seeing that I'm a virgin? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And already your cousin Elizabeth, uh, in her old age, has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. She who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a one point sermon with five little bitty points. And the one point sermon is this to find this pattern before us that is in Mary's life that is also in your and my life. Here are the five things that Mary ex experiences or that happen to Mary. She experiences interruption. She experiences fear. She is given definition. She is given explanation. And she is given a sign and assurance. First, Mary's life is interrupted. And it's interrupted by God. She's in a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, and an angel appears. God's messenger speaks. Our translation says greetings, but the Greek word is rejoice. Rejoice, Mary. Rejoice, favored one. The Lord is with you. These are words that sound like a greeting card. You've probably even seen them written on a painting to us. But they're more than that. They're words from the Old Testament, words that are spoken again and again by God when someone has a special role to play in God's plan to save the world. They're words that say that God's got your back, that God's going to give you what you need as you fulfill your role in his plan. They're words of call and they're words of promise. But they're words that interrupt. They're more shocking than your alarm clock. They're more formative than your Facebook feed. This saving God who pulls all creation towards a new future interrupts individual lives, interrupts in personal ways. So Mary is interrupt and interrupted. Mary is scared. She is afraid. Think about this word she receives. You, Mary, an out-of-way, an out-of-way Galilee, an out-of-way Nazareth, not center of the earth, Jerusalem. You, Mary, God is calling. You, God is with. And her response is terror. She is scared. This is the fear of faith, the fright of knowing God and knowing that God being with you isn't always a box of chocolates, but a transformative journey. Do you remember the hobbits? Right? Bilbo, the older hobbit, goes on a trip. He, it's a there and back again. You can read about it in The Hobbit. He goes and finds gold and sees dragons, and he comes back to the Shire, basically the same hobbit that he's always been. But Frodo Baggins, his nephew, goes on a journey. Frodo goes away and comes back different. He comes back a transformed hobbit. Trips don't transform you, but journeys do. Mary is right to be scared. When the triune God of Red Sea crossing and Easter morning resurrection interrupts, salvation is here and life will not be the same. Some of you know this. Some of you have been disturbed, 
interrupted, scared by this living God. But God doesn't leave us in a place of fear. The Lord sends the angel to Mary with the message, do not be afraid. But the angel doesn't leave it at that. This is the third little point. The angel, the Lord through the angel gives definition. God's antidote to fear is to work very concretely in our present. What God will do in Mary's life will unfold in concrete ways. God doesn't interrupt and leave us in the abstract but speaks and works in the concrete. God gives definition. The Lord defines what Mary will do and what he will do. Mary will conceive. She will bear a son. She will name him, right? These are active verbs, conceive, bear, name. These are her ways to be faithful. These are her tokens of trust. But God will call, he will call this child son, and God will give, he will give him a throne. And on that throne, Jesus will reign forever. This is what will be the birth and reign are God's interruption in Mary's life. And even though they will be difficult and heartbreaking, even though they will be confusing to her and others, they will be good. Can you just take a moment and let the goodness and the difficulty settle in. We think that if we are following Jesus' disciples, everything will go well for us and be easy, but that is not the promise. Do not fear, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The promise of God is his choosing, is his election, is his blessing, and is his presence with and of you as his child. All that hear the message are elected into it brought, invited. The doors are thrown open. But this gets worked out in concrete, everyday ways that require of us strength and courage in a way where your responsibility and God's responsibility aren't competitive, right? But are in sync and they are together. God gives definition when God but God also gives explanation. Mary says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel gives an answer. It's almost like a poem. The simple summary from Cliff Notes is one word. God is the explanation. But the poem goes like this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Almighty will overshadow you. The language here just sounds biblical to us, but if we can look with our Bible x-ray glasses on and see and hear connections, we hear Luke telling a story here and using words from other parts of his gospel. When the angel says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Luke is, is grabbing Acts 2, the other, another book that he read. In Acts 2 is when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples so that they can be the hands and feet and saving presence of Jesus throughout the whole world. The Spirit comes upon them. It's poured out on Pentecost. Mary is having a Pentecost foretaste here as the Holy Spirit comes upon her. The other phrase is that the power of the Almighty will overshadow you. This is the same language that Luke uses when he talks about the transfiguration of Jesus. When he, Jesus takes his four friends up to the top, his three friends up to the top of the mountain and the glory of the Lord overshadows the mountain and shines through the body of Jesus Christ. The glory of the Lord will overshadow Mary, not shine through her, but shine upon her, just as the Spirit will be poured out upon her. This is the explanation. God's Holy Spirit will conceive in her womb a new world, a new world reborn through the life of Jesus Christ. We say that we believe this when we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Holy Spirit. The, the Virgin Mary. Mary, here's the explanation, Gabriel says. The 
Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Almighty will overshadow you. So when God interrupts, he gives definition, he gives explanation, but he also gives signs and assurance. Right? The Lord doesn't just leave it all in our head. The sign and assurance that Mary is given is this, to re that her cousin Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son and she is in, and she is in her sixth month of pregnancy. She who was called barren because she'd never been able to have kids till now. This is a sign that, that resonates, that echoes other stories in the scripture. But for Mary, it's a relationship, a friendship that will give her support and comfort as she walks through her own pregnancy. Right? It's a sign. It's not written in the sky. It's a sign. It's not some special feeling, but it's a concrete relationship given to Mary to be for her a comfort and strength as she walks the path of discipleship. Along with that sign comes an assurance, a word, for nothing is impossible with God. God can make a way. So, we experience in this life of discipleship what Mary experiences. We experience interruption. We experience fear, but we are given definition, explanations, and signs and assurance right? as we anticipate the incarnation of the word, as we anticipate God to fulfill his promises in our lives. Right? We need the stories of Mary to hold on to. To remember that in the midst of the fear and interruption and loss that this life brings, God is working. And in closing, I want you to think with me about what Mary's response to the angel is. She says, let it be with me according to your word. Let it be according to your word. It's Mary's amen to the angel. Let it be with me according to your word. Her faith right, really echoes her son's faith when he says, not my will, but your will be done on as he heads to the cross. For it's in the life of Jesus, right, in his cross and in his trust, of his father as he dies, as he goes all the way down to death, as he waits in the tomb.